much, Jackie. That was a great uh, last presentation. Very nice to finish with the bang at the end. That was very good. So as I as I indicated earlier, we would like to finish the uh, workshop with a discussion about where we want to go next. Right? What are the key questions that we want to answer in the field of motion event control among bilinguals and second language learners? Because at the at the workshop, we've come out at this issue from lots of different angles. Some people have looked at transfer in second language learners and bilinguals, looking at very different structures, just one about motion, but others looked at, at manner and path, uh, some, at, uh, some looked at deictic verbs and others at, at, at manner and path. Then there are, are contributions that look at the influence of uh, different languages on non-linguistic cognition, so we enter the field of linguistic relativity there. Then there are contributions about multimodality. What do gestures tell us about acquisition um, and about bilingual language behavior? Um, so all these issues come together in this wonderful little workshop, but I wonder which are the issues that we should be taking forward? How can we actually proceed in this field of research? And the second related question to that is, what are the methods that we would need to get further with this research agenda? Again, we have seen lots of different approaches here, right? We have seen uh, text linguistic, corpus linguistic approaches. We've seen more experimental work. Um, and I think we need both, but maybe we can have a discussion about how we would like to take this agenda forward. So I've asked uh, Panos if he would like to uh, kick off this discussion and give us uh, a view uh, how he sees the, the research agenda develop further. And then after that, everybody's invited to join in and, and give his or her view. So over to you, Panos. Great. Um, thanks, Janine. And just to... Um... To say really on behalf of everyone, thank you for organizing a fantastic um, workshop for, for everyone. And I really enjoyed, you know, all the talks that uh, um, we saw. And I think everything was was really, really beneficial and super good. And um, this is, I want to basically, you know, just take the, the pivot from you to um, talk about, take it, take not one step back, two steps back, like uh, Michael Jackson, you know, um, uh, referred to by Renan there in the, in the chat. We started a private conversation about Mick Jagger's moves. I'm not going to go into that. But uh, I'm, I am going to share my um, screen just for a second uh, here, um, just to have you know this slide as a as a backdrop, really. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, can everybody everybody see the slide? Yes, you know, yes, perfect. Yeah. So I think that, um, yeah, so taking two steps back, you know, the starting point um, of all this is obviously the fact of linguistic diversity, right? We're looking at different typologies and different ways that languages cut up or, or encode reality in different ways. And essentially, the, the question that we're trying to um, answer is how does that um, affect construal? Construal conceived in a broad way, as Janine um, mentioned. And, um, and uh, here, so we're talking about, you know, um, interpretation that can be indexed in different ways. So if we're talking about different theoretical strands, obviously one theoretical strand is a thinking for speaking hypothesis, you know, that speakers structure information differently when they prepare content for speech. And um, we had, you know, talks that uh, look at the um, index of this in terms of information structure preferences, discourse patterns, um, as well as core verbal behavior, like uh, gesture, for example. And then we also have um, uh, studies in the linguistic relativity tradition, where um, researchers look at whether speakers of different languages perceive the world differently, uh, typically indexed by cognitive behavior, like categorization or visual search or recognition memory, uh, with or without verbal interference and, and flash suppression and all these you know, fancy uh, sophisticated um, techniques that come up uh, time and again in, in um, cognitive science. And I think we've we've actually done a lot more than um, than those um, things here. So we've been we've been sort of broad and inclusive in our um, theoretical and methodological approach. We've also uh, gone a bit beyond the typical typological classifications in considering um, other languages that have not been typically um, looked at. And also looking at a wide range of um, second language learners and bilinguals. And I think this is perhaps um, one of the most important aspects here is to look at 
um, the learning uh, situation as a process, not as something static, not as something, you know, um, sort of binary. You either get it or you don't get it. You know, there are different gradations, there are different variables that uh, may come into play. So we looked at childhood bilingualism and the insights that one came from that, naturalistic um, learners, um, classroom learners, and, um, and so on. Um, so I think, you know, already we are we're sort of fulfilling a lot of, you know, ticking out of boxes here in terms of what the workshop has um, really achieved in, 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 in bringing together. But I think it went even more, even beyond that, you know. Um, it, it, we also looked at different le learnability issues here and, um, you know, different um, teaching methodologies, you know, how, how people can actually uh, learn to think or to think for speaking in a second language. And I think it's precisely at this point that I see um, cognitive scientists on the theoretical side, like myself, and language practitioners more on the practical side, coming together to um, towards a, a mutual goal here, something that will benefit uh, both fields. Because as researchers, we treat second language users or learners as a means to an end. You know, they are an empirical locus for research questions aimed at shedding lights on you know, human language and cognitive processes and presentations and things like that. But of course, learning to express and think about motion or more generally about construal in novel ways is also an end in itself, right? So from a pedagogical perspective, you know, the benefit is, is, is reciprocal. So as researchers, you know, we can all shed light on whether restructuring is possible. And I think the more pertinent question there is not whether it's possible or not, because that commits you to a yes or no question that ultimately possibly leads to a dead end. But rather, what are the factors that may facilitate or hinder uh, the potential for um, restructuring? And this is where I see methodologies, teaching um, methodologies coming um, into play, because the practitioners can really um, you know, um, latch onto this and uh, tell us something about the how. How can we highlight? certain aspects of construal, how can they make them more learnable uh, for, um, for people? So I think, yeah, with this, with this last remark, you know, the issue of learnability and the issue of, of the different methodologies, um, I would probably then um, uh, pose this as, as, as the kind of big question here, you know, in terms of moving the, the field um, forward and, and, um, and yeah, throw, throw the ball back to, to organizers and to everybody really to, 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 to chime in, to, um, this uh, discussion. But yeah, thank you once again, Janine and, and Frybet, for such a, a really very interesting um, uh, workshop. Much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Panos. That was very helpful. So the floor is open for, for further comments on what people would like to contribute and lessons learned from the workshop, what you think, where you want to go next. So please feel free to come forward. Uh, Frybet. Well, um, um, I think I found, um, I think that one question and that uh, brings me to Panos uh, um, plenary yesterday is um, what type of learning, what is the, the type of learning that, uh, that we speakers um, do? So is it associative learning that help us to acquire these uh, uh, um, structures or any structure. And if that's the case, then what should be the strategies to help then um, in practice as uh, learners to uh, learn these uh, difficult structures um, in a better way. So we need to answer Okay, is a, what, what are the sort of um, learning strategies that cognitively we use and then how to apply it? So this is why also I think that uh, is really interesting to see what are the results uh, of a studies as the one that Juan Pablo or Sergio are doing in um, you know, with the video clips in, uh, uh, in, in schools or in uh, learning settings and see whether the, their strategies uh, work. 
can uh, just very briefly uh, add a little, oh, I'm muted, no, I'm, I'm there now, yes. This, one, this notion of associative learning that Panos also mentioned, I think that's a very important one. And I think that in, in SLA and, and more traditional forms of language teaching, we have maybe too much focused on the communicative aspect of language learning. This might sound very controversial to say that, I know, in this forum. But I think, how do we actually learn new things? Is it really by communicating or is it in, in other ways that we actually learn much better? Is it actually time for a re uh, for reconsidering um, behaviorist methods of, of learning, associating um, form, uh, form and meaning through repetition, rote learning, reinforcement. I wonder if, if that is something that we should be considering more uh, in the field of, of motion event uh, construal. I feel that very much with the experiment that uh, Tony did for his PhD, what we got people to do is, is a repetition of a lot of, um, of, of structures in association with some pictures representing that particular motion. We're not moving clips, so they were static pictures, right? But people were offered these and they had to focus on the meaning on the actual movement that was going on in the in these pictures and then at the same time focus on the exact way to express that movement right so they were making four meaning connections all the time in a kind of yeah i would call it repetitive way right so i don't know how controversial this is but i feel you know, this is not a communicative language teaching, in my view, but maybe Tony will come in and, and be very angry at me now for saying this, but I don't think this is communicative language teaching, right? You don't put yourself in a situation where you have to communicate with somebody else. You are communicating with the materials, if you like, right? If that is communication, then that's fine. But I think learners are often not really ready for communicating with somebody else. They don't have the means, but these kinds of structured input activities that are offered through this from pattern input processing or processing instruction approach, make it possible to actually make these new four meaning mappings. I see it as, an, as a kind of new behaviorism, but maybe I'm wrong. I'd like to just throw that in into the mix. May I say something? <laughs> yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, communicative learning, learning through communication probably is not the right thing. But we have to be uh, very practical. All these complicated structures, they are extremely interesting to investigate and in, in, extremely inter, in, in interesting what we saw today and yesterday. But how necessary are they? Is it really necessary that a learner can say he ran into the house or that a learner just says he entered the house. So is it really necessary to become native-like or is it perhaps just necessary to grow a very large vocabulary to have a communicative proficiency, yes, in many contexts uh, so I think about our Chinese learners in the UK. Their problem is not that they can't use manner verbs in boundary crossings, and they can't use manner verbs in boundary crossings, but that's not their problem. Their problem is that they have a small vocabulary and they cannot understand the lectures. That's the important thing, to grow their vocabulary. Okay. Um... Tony had some points in the in the chat. Would you like to contribute to these points, Tony? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think um, Michael uh, is absolutely right. Um, in, in that particular case, of course, there are lots of different kinds of learners. Um, and I've seen that um, essays at, um, for CAE for proficiency um they you know they still have those problems at that high level and um 
although there are whole sections in proficiency books and CAE books on stagger, stumble, um, and different manner verbs, they're just not used by the students themselves in production. Um, and if they were, they, they, you know, perhaps they could achieve a higher score uh, in their essays and in their productive um, um, assessments, you know. Um, so uh, there are different kinds of learners. Michael's right in, in the sense that it's not a key priority for, for many learners. However, I think there is certainly a, an advantage for higher level learners um, if they can incorporate that uh, in production you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, their expression. Um, the, the point that I was making about the English file book, um, which is one of the few books that actually uh, addresses it, they seem to have got the cart before the horse um, um, and they're, they've got 20 different prepositions and a dog just doing one manner of movement, just running around all of these places. Whereas I would have liked to have seen um, uh, just a binary um, contrast between up or down or in, into and out of, and then some, some kind of manipulation of a limited number of uh, manner verbs. And I think that would be much more effective in highlighting the satellite frame system rather than mm. um, having this typical dog run everything. Okay, so that was basically my point. Thank you, Tony. And from, Bill van Patten always says this focus on one thing at a time, right? It's a very simple instruction for teachers, but I think it, it, it is an important one that we have tried to do also in, in the study that you carried out. But can I come back to this issue of behaviorism? Is this very controversial that certain aspects of behaviorism are actually good? Janine, sorry, uh, Martina has been raising her hand. Oh, yes. For, uh, yeah, for yeah. Martina, please do go ahead. Okay, uh, no, I seem uh, we all realize, we all agree that it's so difficult to learn higher level manner uh, verbs. And sometimes I wonder why though, because if we think of children's literature, uh, children's literature is full of uh, manner verbs. Also um, children's literature that is used uh, with L2 learners, L3 learners, L4 learners, for example, here schools work a lot now with children's literature and still um, they do not seem to realize how central these manner of motion verbs are in English. So my feeling is always that speakers of low manner salient languages do not seem to realize that there is such a great variety of higher level manner of motion verbs in English. So uh, awareness uh, is one of the first steps towards learning this, I think, because um, there are some learners who are ambitious and would like to achieve higher levels of English. So at the moment when they realize that, uh, that uh, motion is such a salient feature of English, then they go and try and learn them, but not before that, uh, because also of the lack of negative evidence, as some of you emphasize in uh, their publications, if they overuse this basic verbs, uh, they will not be corrected at school. Um, so this awareness raising, I find this is uh, might be important to some extent and perhaps um, exploiting children's literature a bit more might also be a, an idea. Yeah, the, this, the issue of, of noticing has been uh, mentioned by several people also in the presentations, right? Awareness and noticing. They are, of course, really important, but I do think there is a difference between you know, being able to analyze and, and metalinguistic ability and actually being able to use in a day to day communication setting or, or non communicative setting these verbs in an appropriate way and i think that is where the new techniques come in and the, the the gamification potentially where you get a lot of repetition in a meaningful context of a new form meaning mapping right so you see this movement on the screen in this game and at the same time it's associated with an, an expression that you wouldn't normally uh, use. So I think that is where you get this repetition in a meaningful context of uh, the, the target structures where I feel that, that there is a huge potential for actually um, 
changing um, the learner's uh, internal grammar, if, if we like. Do, do other people see that as, as, an, as a point that they would agree with or disagree with? Or please feel free to disagree. <laughs> um, Rosa. Hi, well, from, from my experience as a teacher, I think that with motion constructions especially, students tend to be unaware that such a thing exists. And uh, as many studies have shown, even people who have been in a, in a foreign country for a long time, they are able to have an advanced level of the second language and still they have problems with the construal of motion events. So I think it's something that it's not enough to be exposed to it. You need explicit instruction on that. And I really think any method works. In my experience, just making them aware of, of the construal, it, it simply works, especially with advanced students. Once you teach them that there is such a thing which is different from their native language and that it is expressing this way and my, making comparisons with the native language, they understand what they have to do and they are able to use it. In fact, I think it's not so difficult to teach. I think what's difficult maybe is to see the results in the long term, to see what happens after a year or so. I don't know if Gail or Kimberly are here, but in their talk yesterday, they, they mentioned what well, their teaching was very effective and it, it only took three weeks, but I don't know if they have conducted any study in the past or they are thinking of doing something similar, of observing what happens after some months or even after a year. And I think this follow-up is also necessary. Thank you. Um, Sergio. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me there? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, so I have three things to mention if I'm allowed to. Uh, I'll share my screen um, if that's not a problem. Um, the first thing I would like to talk about, um, I'll try to be brief, but I think I'll take five or 10 minutes on this, is that um, I think uh, in many places around the world, um, the house is burning. We are dealing with a very, very strong problem, which is a very low proficiency that we observe with our um, students who are trying hard to learn English, and yet they have very poor results. Um, I'm showing you here this um, random uh, study from EF. Some of you probably know it. Um, the methodology can be questionable in many aspects, and yet I do think it does reflect to some extent uh, the problem that we're facing. For instance, uh, down over here in Mexico, you can see that uh, Mexico is considered in this ranking, the 82nd uh, worst um, um, place uh, as to how proficient we are or not at speaking English as a foreign language. So that's, that's uh, personally my greatest concern. How, how do I contribute to fighting this problem uh, down over here? Um, we could take a look at other rankings of um, how speakers of English as a foreign language do around the world, but this is just one random uh, reference. So I've been wondering uh, for some years how we can transcend all these issues. And I've been aspiring, I wouldn't say that I've been able to reach the point at which I have a formal proposal for this, but I'm working on it. And my aspiration is to achieve the exper experientialist. I'm, I'm naming this the experientialist method. You, you, so, several of you were talking about um, whether associative learning, communicative um, uh, learning, and so on. Um, but I've been thinking about this for some years, and I think that we should aim at something that I am um, um, terming, uh, for lack of a better term, the experientialist method. I think that first and foremost, what we have to achieve um, in, in the classroom, uh, whether physically or online, is an experience. Um, if I am able to make my students build an experience um, during 50 minutes of class that connects to um, their world, the way they feel, the way they think, uh, that, that I am able to actually engage them. Uh, you, you know, there are people who study hard how to uh, provoke engagement. And if I am able to achieve this engagement on the part of my students, I think I am being able to build an experience, 
And if I am able to build a, a meaningful experience, I think, um, you know, Lake of Anjansan, uh, the experiential in experientialist approach uh, to language, um, that I should be able to actually get some uh, tangible results. And so I dare to say that we need to transcend to some extent. Uh, I'm not saying that we should get rid of it. Uh, there's, they are and, and should continue to be very useful, but we should transcend the book format. The books are very useful, but they have some limitations and we need to find ways to um, help our students achieve more experiential, um, more, more meaningful experiences in, in, in the classroom. And I think communication is part of a cognitive system. Uh, that's what I'm showing you. These are all notes that I was just uh, jotting down as I was listening to uh, you all. And I also think that language is part of our cognitive neural representations. And the most, uh, I, I'm not sure if language is the most important part of cognitive, cognitive neural representations, but I think that's what we should be looking at. How do we make or form a mental representation of the world? Um, Psychological and psychologically and neurologically. Uh, that, that's why I have so much interest on on visual visual stimuli. Okay. I read some... Maybe we can sort of round off now and give some other people a chance to. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but just to just to finish this. Uh, so, my my was wondering uh, to what extent would it be possible to um, work together to join forces and actually develop some practical materials that we can use with with our students in the classroom um, that, that, that I can use it next Monday or next or in one week from now, something that is more practical that I can actually come and show to my students. So, so I don't know if that's something. Thank that... you. Yeah. Okay. I think there were some others with their hands up, but I'm now in a screen where I don't see that. Uh, Tony, did you still want to come in? Your hand is yeah, up. I was just going to go back to, go back to the point that you made about behaviorist approach. And and over the five day period of uh, of the instructional phase and and the the, the pre test and the the immediate post test, uh, my students were exposed to three hundred uh, targets in that very short space of time. So we're just talking about into and out of, okay, and 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 there were five or six different manner verbs, but with a focus on into and out of. So I definitely think the uh, the repetition over that short space of time of that it really helped to um, raise the awareness of the structure. Yeah, but it was not just a repetition. It was a direct connection between that that uh, structure and some visual materials, right? So that is what yeah, I, yeah, I took away from a Panos's a article in 2015, mm. right? Maybe Panos would like to comment on that. But your idea was, I think, that you need you can only restructure your your cognition on in this domain if you have a new pairing between the visual stimuli and the linguistic expression, right? Can I just come in very, very quickly because I have to go? Yeah. I mean, yes, sorry. of course. Uh, so I was just going to, to address precisely this, this issue, but also in relation to um, what we, we heard uh, just now, um, uh, that we need to move away from, from, from books and just make it a bit more uh, sort of ecologically valid, I guess, for, for want of a better word. And I think that if you, look at the if you look at the empirical studies, including mine, but others as well that we heard um, in this workshop, that have systematically looked at the length of residency or the length of exposure variable, um, more often than not, they will find that it's significant. It's a significant variable, you know, predicting um, outcomes. Having said that, it's still not very well defined as to what that variable actually is. You know, so what does length of stay do? Is it that it, it's a proxy for proficiency? Are you mimicking? native speakers because you live in the second language speaking country and by me mimicking I'm, I'm literally you know saying visually for example you know how they they talk but i think that if we're talking about motion i think the domain itself is lent itself a little bit more to ecologically valid learning because i think when you're immersed in in, in um, a native speaker environment you have a chance of hearing the expressions in the context that they're uttered and i think this is for example and uh, underlies why we find effects of um, audiovisual exposure in, in, in learners when they watch. You know, we, we, we looked at this in, um, 
it's variable with the Swedish uh, learners of English. And in Sweden, um, all the, 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 the TV and cinema and everything is not dubbed. Everything is sub subtitles and you, you, watch the, you watch something and you hear the target language. Uh, but for example, in somewhere like um, Germany, you know, things are dubbed. So you don't have a chance to, to hear the, the target uh, constructions. And I think that in and of itself, just the mere fact that you're exposed, for example, to more money verbs, could have an effect, like Freibet, you know, showed in, in her data, for example, you know, that simply the, the proportion increases, you know, in your production, both in your, in your second language and in your, your first language, um, importantly. So I think, you know, I'm not saying that the, if statistical frequency alone will do the trick, mm -hmm. but because so many studies show us that it's a, a significant variable, I think perhaps a starting point could be to just probe it a little better, a little more and see what actually constitutes you know um, statistical learning in, in this context what is it about yeah. length of exposure that actually highlights the the, the, the concepts more because it could be some of the other notions like noticing coming to play unconsciously here because because these these uh, motion expressions are uttered in context so so it's it's, it's, it's not like um, color or objects where he yes, asked the, the, the topic of conversation has to be something specific about that you know for for, for learners to be exposed to the target language. Um, motion, you know, includes verbs of action that occur almost, you know, um, on, a, on a daily basis. So perhaps, yeah, just probing a little bit more, you know, the frequency of, of, of what constitutes rather the effects of, of length of, of residence and length of stay in a sort of systematic way, right? You know, so, so conduct a study with, with the aim of, of, of having enough variability in your data to find any potential effects and then see what, um, what underlies the effect. And so I think in that way, we're a bit hampered with regards to the instruments we have for recording the biographical um, background of our participants. Yeah. Because yes, we have some really good measures like uh, the LEAP, for example, and other questionnaires, you know, but you know, they, they, they don't go far enough in, as to what, what actually constitutes um, exposure and, and, and yeah. what defines um, length of, of residence. And with that, I'm, I'm really so sorry. I, it's so interesting. I want to stay more, but I have a, a, a trilingual uh, son who's waiting for me to, to take him out. This is him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, absolutely. You are, you are absolutely right. Your son needs you. I didn't know that. <laughs> what are the three languages? What are his three languages? Uh, Greek, uh, Greek, Serbian, and English, which are all, I think, typologically distinct with regards to manner and, and path, but they all have a grammatical aspect to some extent, I think. So, very interesting <laughs> participant for, for the future. He, he, I can, I can give you the, well, before the... you go, let's say thank you very much indeed, panels, for a great plenary and for a very great.